the history of great accomplishments is very often a history of individuals, not institutions. The last year, a few individuals got together and set out to listen to the world's oldest sounds. We called our quest First Sounds. First Sounds isn't even a year old, and already collaborators have undertaken extensive original research, forged partnerships with public and private archives, preserved recordings in public and private archives, and brought together experts to accomplish some pretty significant technological firsts. It's the technological first that I'd like to discuss with you this morning. The oldest sound that we could have heard up until this week is from 1888. Now, I understand there are sounds that claim to be older, but their provenance and their chain of custody are not solid enough to date them with certainty. Recording of the, recordings of the very oldest sounds are in the institutions in which they were deposited right after they were made. The historic record and the institution's chain of custody imbue unimpeachable provenance on these artifacts. As Patrick showed, the oldest recordings were never intended to be played back. They are visual items. They are phonograms, sound recordings registered in smoke, or rather, smoked paper. In October of last year, Renee and I met with Carl Haber and Earl Cornell at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. We pitched the idea of working together to make the oldest recordings talk. Carl and Earl said, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and they agreed to adapt the image to sound technology for which they are so famous. And all we had to do, simple thing, was acquire extraordinarily high resolution scans directly from the original artifacts. We started with our good friend Jerry Fabris at the Edison National Historic Site. Jerry had long wanted to get preservation grade scans made of 19 phonograms owned by the site. So Jerry and I talked, we went through the appropriate channels. Uh, the, sky, the site was loaned a scanner with very high optical resolution. And in a very pleasant day's work, I watched Jerry scan every sheet. The site at the end of that day had preservation copies of the phonograms, and now we have copies to give to Carl and to Earl. Let me tell you about these phonograms. Actually, let me tell, let the New York Daily Graphic tell us about them. These sketches are from the front page of the Saturday, July 13th issue. Rapid transit is a great blessing, but it annoys the industrious denizens of Sixth Avenue. In despair, the directors appeal to the Wizard of Menlo Park. Notice the big bag of money in the director. <laughs> who proceeds on an investigating tour to the dismay of the railroad employees. Here's a picture of Mr. Edison in suspense as to the causes of the racket. Here's Edison's assistant, studying the sounds back at the lab. We heard about bottled sound earlier before. You see bottles of vibrations of disjointed rails, echoes from loose bolts, clatter of fly hooves uh, over tin pans, and so forth. The scientific news of July 15th told, really, what was happening. Pandemonium was let loose on 6th Avenue the very day the elevated railway began to run and it has kept up its incessant din ever since that hour. Some of the residents on those streets are very unhappy about it and threaten to go to the courts or to the lunatic asylum unless the noise is stopped. The outcry has alarmed the managers of the road and the renowned Edison has been employed to look for the evil. My mission, Mr. Edison said, is to determine the sources of the noise. I've been up and down on the road now as many as a hundred times. My assistants have been with me and we've taken accurate chronicles. We've driven the trains, lain in the convolution of the girders, wandered upon the track, and studied the vibrations from all imaginable points. Edison goes on to explain how he turned a phonograph 
into a phonograph. His idea, after the invention of the phonograph, half a year later, was not to play back sound, which he could have done easily with a phonograph. He intended to study it visually. And for that, he needed a retrograde phonograph. So he had Charles Batchelor build one out of an old Brady model he had lying around. Charles Blatchell is the gentleman in the middle. He's been called his chief partner, and he really was. What we see here is a Brady card, and on it the Brady model that Rene showed us. Edison and Batchelor made three important changes to this machine. This is the resulting phonogram. We believe it to be a very highly accurate representation of what they actually made. The first change they made was in the cranking mechanism. You see that they have a gear down mechanism here so that they can turn quickly and in theory keep a more stable speed. The original phonograph, of course, you crank the axle directly. So that was the first change. The second change was the mounting sideways of the diaphragm. On the original phonograph, the diaphragm pushed the recording stylus into the groove. In this one, they wanted to see the sound wave sideways, so they turned the recording mechanism sideways. The third improvement was an addition. Edison called this his telegraph key, being an old telegrapher. And this telegraph, telegraph key could be pressed down at any point in the recording and make a marking to the side of the sound recording. This would help them indicate, once they got back to the lab, what sounds were worth paying attention to. That's the only image we have of the phonograph that, image made, that Edison made. It certainly does not survive. Now, you can barely see this. This is taken right out of Charles Batchelor's notebook on the phonograph. We've clarified it for you here. This is the uh, cylinder looked at from the side. The recording mechanism turned sideways so that when it vibrated this way, the waveforms in the groove recorded this way. And here's the telegraph key in the back. Batchelor was a master draftsman. This was July 7th of 1878. Within a few days, they were on the road, the railroad, that is, and they started making phonographs. Here's Jerry at the Edison uh, National Historic Site. Is David Packard in the room? We want to point out the brand name of this uh, <laughs> scanner. <laughs> Very high quality optical scanner. <coughs> Jerry's making the last phonogram adjustments. And here's a full body scan, if you will, <laughs> of a loose phonogram, a phonogram that was just in the box, hanging out loose. What do we notice about this? Well, you can see the lines going across. You can see some writing up here, which we'll get to in a minute. This writing here says 40 feet away from platform. So we know from the writing on here and the notes that they were standing 40 feet away from the platform of a, of a train, and, you know, the train's going by at high speed. You have X's, you had markings on here. Let's look a little closer at those. September 19th, Metropolitan Elevated Railroad. This is the last day that they took these tests. You see some activity up here, a big X through it, and then you have train down right here. Something started here, probably a train. And it went to here. And then you see they adjusted the mechanism, it started again. So these things are covered with little markings that tell us, indicate to us, what they were recording. Here's a close-up. You can see the waves in the groove. Some of them have more modulation or different types of modulation than others. You can see that the waveforms are complex. They don't have a lot of amplitude, unfortunately. This is the phonogram turned 90 degrees and compressed 
vertically. So that we're looking at the entire phonogram, top to bottom now. This is just the first 38 uh, grooves or rotations of the phonogram. We have little X's here where they stop the machine. If you were making a phonogram, what would you do? Well, the first thing you'd do is adjust it. And you would adjust it with some noise, and the easiest noise to make is with your mouth. This is, this is probably the equivalent of testing, testing. The second section, which starts at the uh, red X, is where we see train down. And actually what we, what we believe is on this phonogram is the sound of three rapidly passing trains. Then, apparently, uh, the modulation wasn't good enough. Something needed adjusting. They did some more vocal testing. This is the sound of New York in 1878. Didn't sound like a train. <laughs> What was the noise they were listening for? Edison, we think, gave a very accurate explanation when he said this. <clears throat> the iron rods forming the lattice work of the trestles are like untuned reeds. They're eight feet long. They're unfixed except at the ends. Now, the force of a train going along at high speeds causes these rods to vibrate. I've noted them swaying two inches out of the per perpendicular. I caught hold of one in motion and was obliged to let go in a hurry. <laughs> here's, the, here's the key. When they are set whirring, they make music, like the strings of a great harp. At least it would be music if they were harmonious. As it is, they all work at a different tune and produce discord. This isn't the sound of the train going by. This is the sound the trestle made as the train went by. There's a little bit more that we have worked on. Take a quick listen to that. It's basically test vocalizations. Now we haven't tried to restore this. This is just playing back at one revolution per second. We know there's a lot of speed fluctuation. We know that there's all sorts of things that can be done to this sound. But this, this was our first proof of concept. These were the first sounds ever pulled from a phonogram. And they're real sounds taken out of the air. There are 18 more phonograms. There's a whole other half of this one that we haven't even begun to work on yet at the Edison National Historic Site. We hope someday to hear them all. And I'd love to hear Edison say, geez, Batch, it sure is hot out here today. <laughs> This is a uh, photograph generally considered to be the first photograph taken from nature. 1826, Niepce, French, it's an eight-hour exposure. What we're dealing with here, with phonograms, is something every bit as primitive and groundbreaking. We can work on these 
ghostly images, to bring them out, to bring the ghost forward. But there's only so far we're going to be able to get. But still, it is a photograph from 1826, or it's a sound, in this case, from 1878. Something up until recently, nobody was ever to, able to extract from the, uh, from the page. And it's fitting that this is a French photograph, because as Patrick pointed out, we say Leon Scott for short, was French, born in Paris, and invented this whole idea of recording sound from the air onto paper over time. Let me say that again. Sound from the air onto paper over time. And this is his brevet de invention. This is what he submitted at the French Patent Office in 1857. He made a certificate of addition in 1859. In each one of these two deposits, he submitted a phonogram. Now, up until last December, we knew this one existed. We only had a hint that this one existed. We verified that in December on a trip to the patent office. Let's talk first about 1857. His recording technique was still crude, but you see sound waves, or some sort of waves, recorded in a groove. Excuse me, I keep saying groove, in a trace. A little bit closer, phonotography of the human voice at a distance. Even closer yet, you can see how close this is because you're looking at the French seal of the patent office all around here. <laughs> Patrick showed you the device where he would just slide this along the table to make the recording. Here's a close up. This thing would be, probably be pulled underneath the recording stylus. But you could see, watch, watch these lines go up and down as they go across the page here. I mean, these things, it was very primitive. He was just kind of getting it close just to show, just to show the idea. We thought, wouldn't it be cool? <laughs> wouldn't it be cool to hear a sound from 1857? And we chose two traces that we thought would be the most promising. Now, you're going to hear those two traces in a second. You're going to hear them five times. Trace one, trace two. Trace one, trace two. Five times. Each time, we're going to change the speed to see, and see if you can hear anything going on in these traces. it again. We played with these a lot. <laughs> it was a very crude instrument and while sound waves move the stylus, we do not believe that the sound waves were recorded by the stylus. France, 1857, indisputable provenance, the world's oldest retrieved sounds? Probably not. Too crude to be called a recording of a sound. Now there's another phonogram there from 1859. It was deposited in July 29th, so we, it was obviously made before that date. 
Let's take a look at that. What's, here's the full body scan. It was made on a cylinder, on a rotating drum. It's a big technological improvement that Rudolf Koenig uh, brought to the process. There's a classic uh, engraving or etching. And what Scott was trying to demonstrate in this addition to his patent, he wanted to demonstrate the measurement of time on a phonautogram, because he knew. I mean, you were cranking at an uneven speed. You had no idea how much time elapsed under a sound wave when you took it off the mandrel. So Scott's idea was to demonstrate here a couple ways of recording time with his sound. The first was with a diapason or a tuning fork. And these traces that we see outlined in yellow are tuning fork traces. The other way that he mentions in his uh, application is a chronometer. Here the chronometer has, is set down and is making a line continuously. Here there's no chronometer line, but here it starts up again. We're not sure if he was really using a chronometer or whether he was just marking the paper to demonstrate the concept. But as we, as we work towards reproducing this, we said, wouldn't it be cool to hear the tuning fork? You know, 1859 tuning fork. Got nothing better to do. <laughs> First question, though, is what frequency was that tuning fork? Now, Scott wrote that, you know, gave an example. The fork can vibrate at 500 or 1,000 simple vibrations, which in today's language or what he intended to say is 250 or 500 hertz. Um, we know he was working with Rudolf Koenig, the, the great uh, instrument maker of Paris who probably would have chosen 256 hertz for middle C, which is also called scientific pitch, as you know. So there's a couple good candidates there, but nothing definitive. Remember the date that this was made. It was made in the first half of 1859. What happened in France in the first half of 1859? I'll tell you. The French government declared 435 hertz as diapason normal, or the A above middle, middle C, government decree. <laughs> Just months before Scott made this, or perhaps even during that time. Now that's a good candidate. There's another point that helps us triangulate into, into the 435. Scott actually counted the vibrations. And he ended here on the phonautogram at 2600, well, 2,610, oh no, wait a minute, 2,613. That's an odd number. Why did he stop there? We didn't know. He writes about a chronometer trace hitting the paper every six seconds. So we said, well, what happens then if this was a chronometer trace that he was marking, and you divide 2,613 by six, <laughs> You get 435.5. Point 0.5? Where's that come from? <laughs> the answer came to us out of a secondary source written 30 years later. In his very exact determination of the pitch of the diapason normal, Koenig, who Scott was working with, kept the fork vibrating in a constant temperature over a period of months and found that the diapason normal executed 435.45 instead of 435 vibrations per second. Scott was showing us how smart he was. <laughs> Here's the full body scan. We're gonna to listen to the tuning fork. I'm gonna take you through the progression of processing. The tuning fork is so badly recorded on here that we could only find a little snippet to play back. But it worked in Jurassic Park. They just found a little DNA, <laughs> built the Tyrannosaurus Rex, so we thought we would try that too. Here's the first sound that came back to us. I'm going to play that again. Listen to the pitch change. There, we evened out the pitch. It's 100 hertz, I believe, on this recording. You can even out a pitch, easy to do in uh, sound editing software. So we took the waviness 
of the tone, straighten it out. Loop it. Bring it up to 435. A lot of background noise in there. I mean, this is just soot. And then why not run it through a notch filter? <laughs> sound of a tuning fork, 1859. The world's oldest retrieved sound to date. cheating because they'd been making tuning fork recordings for decades before this. The tuning fork wasn't the sound captured out of the air. Well, early this month, uh, we found evidence of a stash of Leon Scott phonograms, evidence, that really nobody had kind of known about beforehand, or the world had forgotten about. <coughs> Within days of learning of this, I was on a plane to Paris. And I had went to the archives of the Academy of Sciences. Since we were going to go there to look at these new Scott phonograms, I also requested Charles Crow's famous plis caché. It's a beautiful little thing. But we also got to look at Scott's principles of phonotography which he deposited in 1857, just before depositing his first patent application. And what made that really cool? We found the first phonograms, according <coughs> to Scott. Indefinite, whether it's 53 or 1853 or 1854, but they are pasted into here. And then, in the back of the folder, there were phonograms. Another phonogram. Another a luscious phonogram. <laughs> <laughs> and phonogram number five, which we're going to talk about here. <coughs> These were deposited in 1861. All of the ones that were dated were dated 1860. And at this time, a couple things had happened. Scott had improved his own technology significantly, as we're going to find out here. And he was very, always very conscious of, conscious of the public record, of the record of being first. And you can't see it in, on this low resolution projection. But he has written across here his track listing. OK? By the way, that's the first record label right there. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've turned it into a ransom note so you could kind of see it here. But he writes, by the light of the moon, French folk songs sung, the pitch is measured by the tuning fork of 500 simple vibrations per second, which writes directly and simultaneously in interlinear space of the song. So the pitch is mentioned, is, is mentioned, but what about the song itself? First record label. And this is a close-up of four revolutions of Scott's 1860 phonogram number five. There, the tracks come in pairs. There's the first revolution, the second revolution, third and fourth revolution. This is just a small, tiny part of the phonogram. In each pair, he has the sound as recorded from the air through the membrane, and he has a tuning fork trace off to the side. Yeah. <laughs> this is why I was on the plane. <laughs> Let's hear how it came back from Earl after we stitched it all back together. On this channel, on this stereo recording from 1860, you're going to hear the tuning fork. In this channel, listen to this one hard if you can. You're going to hear the voice, and you're going to hear it ah, 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 because of the way they're cranking it. Yep, let's hear it again. I love that track. <laughs> 
what's the first thing all you audio engineers are going to do out there? You're going to correct for time. You got a tuning fork, you know it's vibrating 500 hertz, you're going to make this track. Now this was recorded in smoke. A lot of crackle, thumping, all sorts of things going on. So, you audio engineers, impulse noise reduction. Equalization. The first playable dated recording of the human voice, quite probably the very first of all time. It's just so cool. <laughs> the world has recaught phonograph fever since it was, this was published on the front page of the New York Times yesterday. The international press has been incredible. This is certainly the most played sound file on earth today. And the beauty part is we got all the news agencies paying for our bandwidth. <laughs> What does this mean? Well, I think the historic record is clear. Edison's phonograph of 1877 was, in fact, the first machine to both capture sounds from the air and to play them back, indisputably. Scott's phonograph was the first machine to inscribe the vibrations of airborne sounds over time as early as 1853 or 1854. In April of 77, the French poet Charles Crow was the first to register the idea of playing back phonographic traces, of regenerating recorded sounds and returning them to the air and to the ear. And we are the first people to actually do so. 147 years, 11 months, and 19 days after Leon Scott recorded a simple French smoke song, folk song, in smoke. <laughs> oh, that's good, smoke song. Huh? <laughs> the winter of 1878 must have been especially cold and bitter for Scott. With the phonograph grabbing the headlines and, ima and imaginations of Parisians, Scott became increasingly resentful as the press, men of science, and Edison repeatedly failed to acknowledge his work. In May of 1878, Scott self-published a book in which he set forth the priority of his invention, documenting each major accomplishment, each significant exhibition. We know of only two copies. Last fall, we commissioned an electronic scan from the National Library of France, and it's been a cornerstone in our efforts to discover, interpret, and reproduce the world's first sound recordings. It also helps us understand Scott the man, because the history of the phonograph is a very human history. Scott, the man, the tinker, the dreamer, who believed that one could read sounds that wrote themselves on paper. In his introduction to this text, he implores his contemporaries for the support and corroboration of his sound recording achievements. He then strives to set the record straight. I want to read you a loose translation. The public does not know of the invention in 1857 of a French device, not for repeating, but for writing speech, which is what the word phonograph means. Even less familiar is the name of the French inventor. I worked alone in this field from 1854 to 1859, 
In 1861, I presented tests to the Academy of Sciences that I believe closely approached the desired <coughs> results. Yet only recently has Mr. Edison shown us his metallic sheet waffled with punctures. <laughs> so now I pose the major question. In this situation where an inventor confronts a mere mechanic, <laughs> what are the rights of the man who discovers versus the man who just improves? Does nothing remain for the poor artisan who groped for years to develop his methods? Is it right or fair for another to appropriate those methods one after the other and take everything from the artisan inventor, including his honor and his profit? So come, gentlemen of science, render your verdict and make haste, for the debate is ablaze. Everyone knows I put the question to rest in 1861. I place myself as the first to arrive. Come Parisians, don't let them take our prize. I beseech all stout-hearted men, and thank God there are still some, to proclaim my name in this matter. For I am getting old, the father of two sons, and all I can leave them is my good name. Thank you. Megan Hennessy, Mike DeVecca, Patrick Feaster, Rene Rondeau, Bryn Forstadt, Earl Cornell, and Jerry Fabris. These are among the people who made it happen. I'm just a mouthpiece. <laughs> they deserve your applause.